full name is Peter Wiederholt. And uh, I was born in January 1928. That makes me almost 80 years old. I was born in Mala on the island of Jaffa. And uh, that's where my parents were living at that time. My father was a uh, manager of uh, a rubber and coffee plantation. And when I was about four years old, he was transferred to a much larger plantation in uh, East Java, right across from the island of Bali. And uh, he, uh, he was there when the war started. And that's from where, where we were after Japanese occupation and from where we were taken to be in concentration camps for the rest of the war. Initially, it was my mother and my younger brother in a women's camp. I was taken to the women's camp when I was only 14 years old. But by the time I was 15, they took me out and put me in a camp for men. And, um, that, and then I went to another, another camp and I spent in camps until the end of the year, until the end of the war. The plantation is, it was a very large, I don't remember the acreage, but it's very large. And my father was growing coffee and rubber. We had hundreds of rubber trees and coffee. And um, there was also a factory that my father was responsible for, which would do the initial processing of coffee and rubber prior to shipment to the final processors. And uh, life was very isolated for my father was exciting. He had made a promotion, he did very well. For my mother, it was difficult because there was nothing nearby. We were 20 miles away from a tiny little village where there was hardly anything to do. There were no other Dutch people living nearby. There were no schools nearby. And uh, the problem came up by the time I got seven years old, you know, six years old. I couldn't go to school. Initially, my mother taught me at home, but then it was necessary for me to be boarded. And at a very young age, I was boarded with a family in Malang, where there were good schools. And I came home only during vacations. And after we were occupied by the Japanese, I spent time on the plantation with my parents until the Japanese took us out of and put us in concentration camps. The Japanese interest was oil. Indonesia was a producer of oil. It still is a producer of oil. Not as big as the middle as Saudi Arabia, so but it had quite a bit of oil and Japan didn't have any oil of its own. It was in, in a war with China and it was about to get into a war with the US, so they needed oil. And it was very obvious to us that uh, we were going to be a target. And uh, the Dutch government or the Dutch Indies government had made an agreement with the U.S. and Britain uh, saying that uh, if war were to break out, if any of the three countries were attacked, all three of them would be involved. So when Pearl Harbor was attacked, we were within hours we declared war on Japan. We were part of the war. Ultimately, for us, the war was quite different than it was for the U.S. The U.S. fought it out. The Netherlands Indies was a, not small by area, but there was only a handful of Dutch people down there. We had a limited navy and limited air force and limited army. We did what we could, but within three months we were occupied by the Japanese. Prior to that, we participated in it. We, the Dutch Air Force uh, was uh, uh, helpful in defending the Singapore, trying to defend Singapore. Dutch submarines sank a number of Japanese ships that we were very proud of. And ultimately, Japan moved its forces towards Indonesia, a big naval force. They were met by whatever the Dutch had. The, a naval battle ensued in the Jaffa Sea and the Dutch Navy was completely destroyed. There was not a single ship, everything was gone. I had several friends who had fathers serving in the Navy. They all lost their dads. <clears throat> and after that happened, the Japanese could easily land and occupy the country. And since then, we were occupied and we spent most of the time in concentration camps. 
I was boarded with a family in Marlon, and I still remember the day, December 8, 1941. I woke up in the morning as usual to get ready to go to school, and the, the people that I was staying with had the radio on, and suddenly it says there's a special broadcast. The Governor General of the Netherlands Indies came on and he declared that there had been a surprise attack on Pearl Harbor, that the United States had declared war on Japan, and that in accordance with our treaty obligations, we were now also at war with Japan. And that, he said, you can look forward to a difficult time. We will do everything we can. We will participate. We will fight until the end. And uh, we uh, urge you to do whatever you are asked to do. And he ended up with saying, oh, God be with us, and God save the Queen. The Netherlands had a Queen. And we were all shaken up. And then, well, we went to school, and of course we didn't did any schoolwork. Everybody was talking about it. My parents called, and they were alarmed, and they told me that if fighting were to start on Java, to, for me to come home to the plantation, where they thought I would be safer than in the, in the city. So that is the way it started. My parents said, if bombs start falling on Java, you come home. And not long after that, the Japanese bombed Surabaya, which was the naval base, and they dropped some bombs at what is now Jakarta, and my parents said, come home. And then shortly after that, we had this naval battle where the Dutch Navy was completely destroyed. Then everything went very fast. The Japanese landed. I was already on the plantation and uh, was just waiting to see what was going to happen. Schools were closed. We were not allowed to go to school. One of the first things the Japanese said, schools are closed. They did not want any congregations of people, of more than five people. So that was out. And I spent the next couple of months on the plantation. I was bored because there was nobody else around until the Japanese, one day a, a truck arrived with some Japanese soldiers on it. And they stopped in front of the house, they got out, they dragged my father out of the house, dumped him on the truck, told my mother to give him something to get by with for the next few days, took him away. We didn't know where he was taken. They wouldn't tell us. I left my mother behind on a plantation, totally isolated from the outside world, no police nearby, nothing. And then shortly after that, a Japanese officer came to the plantation to take over for my father, and my mother was scared to death that you know, she was there. Anything could happen to her. They could kill her, they could rape her, they could abuse her, and my, the, me and my brother, so she was a nervous wreck. Thank God nothing happened. And my mother was, had not, not much to do. She kept busy planting flowers. She liked flowers. She had a little hobby to make certain folders or purses or pocketbooks out of leather to keep her busy. And I was bored and actually I, uh, I got, in order to keep myself busy, I started to raise chick ducks and chicken to get some eggs and, and my parents said they would buy the eggs for me. And then there was a, a Swiss person that lived Oh, maybe a two-hour walk away from us, and he stopped by, and he, th he thought that since he was Swiss that he could stay out of the war, but as it turned out, he was later on killed by the Japanese. But he was a chemist, and he said, would you be interested in making soap? There was a shortage of soap. I said, oh, sure. And he taught me how to make soap. It involves uh, burning wood and getting ashes and mixing it with oil and all kinds of stuff. And I got involved in that, that to keep myself busy. It only lasted for a short time because after my father was gone, not long after that, a truck came again to collect my mother, my brother, and myself. We, again, they were thrown on the truck, with little belongings, taken to the train station in Banyuwangi, which was the closest town, put on a train and taken to Malang. In fact, Malang happened to be the city where I went to school. 
but of course there was no school and we went into a camp. The women's camp was simply a, a portion of the city that was separated out, barbed wire was put in and it was made into a camp. So we were staying in an area where they had regular homes. It was a lower middle class area and in each home uh, three bedroom home that would have at least three or four families and most of the people sleeping on the floor but there was some furniture in those areas. Life in the women's camp the first three months that I was there was not that bad. There was enough to eat, not everything you want but there was some. But things got progressively worse afterwards. My brother is six years younger than I and he, uh, he stayed with my mother. So he spent the whole war with my mother in a women's camp. But I was in a women's camp for only three months and I spent the rest of the war with my father. That is also a story. My father was taken, we didn't know where he was taken, but as it turned out he was taken to a prison in Jember, another city in, in uh, Java. And one day when we were in the women's camp, an Indonesian priest arrived. Somehow or another he was able to visit the camp with some kind of an excuse because the Japanese wouldn't allow people to come in. But he was Indonesian, he was not Dutch. And he told my mother in confidence because messages, exchange of messages was strictly prohibited. He said, your husband is in a hospital in Malin. And my mother was shocked, what happened? He said, well, he said, he got seriously ill. He has a skin disease, he was oozing all over the place. The Japanese were afraid that he might infect others and themselves, but they kicked him out and they said, here, please get some help. They gave my father a few dollars, just enough to get the cheapest train ride to Malang. He wanted to go to Malang because he knew people in Malang and he knew an Indonesian doctor in Malang. He called him up and the doctor immediately put him in the hospital and treated him. And he, this Indonesian priest, told me about that. So we were, we know, we were aware of that. And uh, my, my mother was distressed about the fact that my father was sick, but at least she knew where he was and that he was still alive. But then he came back about a week, or 10 days later. He said, I got bad news because the Japanese got a hold of him. They didn't want him outside. They took him out, even though he was nowhere near uh, cured from his disease, took him in a camp, and he took him in, in a camp in Malang, which is called the Navy Camp. And we heard about that, and my father, my mother was shocked, you know, and said, my father, and he said my father was in bad shape. Then came shortly after that the announcement that all boys that had, would have reached the age of 15 by December 31st, 1942, they would have to be taken away from their mothers and be taken to another camp. They would never tell you where. I was 14. My birthday is in January. I was going to be 15 in January. So I missed out on it. Great. But I talked to my mother. I said, my father is there. And I said, I have a feeling that they are taking us because that is a big camp nearby, that we will be taken there. I didn't know for sure. So I suggested to my mother that I try to volunteer to go with the rest of the people to be with my father. My mother was shocked. She said, Jesus, you know, she was afraid that she would lose me and never see me again. And I told her, I said, yeah, I said, but I'm also afraid that if I don't help my father, well, you'll probably never see him again anymore. And finally we talked about it and she said, okay, if you want to do that, I said, fine. So uh, <clears throat> I... Then I had to uh, make arrangements to go, and how do you do that? You can't, I can't tell the Japanese that I want to be with my father. So I went as a young boy, 14 years old, and I went to the camp guard, and there was a guard there with a gun and so on, and, and I said, I want to talk to the commander. And he said, what the hell are you doing? He said, how dare you come here? I said, please, said, let me talk to him. Finally, somebody came out, a guy was a you know, big officer, and he scolded me about what I wanted to do, and I said, I'm asking you, I said, boys are going away, I want to go. He said, why? He said, I want to be with my friends. He said, what about your mother? I said, no, I want to be with my friends. And I convinced him that I wanted to go because I wanted to be with my friends. 
he finally said, okay, if that's what you want, fine, but don't change your mind, you know, put you on the list and you go. Don't come back to me and say you changed your mind. I said, okay. So I went. We were picked up, I left, and I was crossing my fingers that I would go to the same camp as my father. We came down there, we went through the gate, and I see a sign, Navy camp. I said, thank God, my guess was right. My father is going to be here. We roll in there, and we get off the truck. We were trucked down there, and my gosh, I see in the center of the, there were three people hanging on poles. They were being whipped. They were screaming from pain, and they were being tortured, and it was horrible. And I was totally intimidated. And the Japanese came there, they uh, uh, threw us uh, off the truck with all the bags and, and we were treated very badly. And finally, I ended up in a barracks where I had a little space to sleep on the floor. And I was terribly in intimidated. And, uh, but uh, my father didn't even know that I was there. So I got out and I started to inquire. I said, uh, Mr. Wiederholt, his name, he was called Willie, Willie Wiederholt. Willem was his first name, and uh, I finally found him. And he was a poor, sick man. He was sitting on a chair. He had hardly any clothes on. He was all bandages all over. He was totally depressed. And he looked like he was about to die. And I come to him, and um, he was surprised, and he was happy to see me. But at the same time, he told me, he said, as happy as I am to see you, I wish you had stayed with your mother because this is a terrible camp. This is horrible here. I said, no. He said, I'll be here. I'll be with you. And then my father was worried that he would be hanging there someday because my father had some colleagues or some other planters that he knew they were hiding weapons, anticipating someday to be liberated. And so my father did not participate. But if the Japanese know that you might know something, they torture you to get everything out of you, even if you don't know what they want to know. They torture you until you're almost dead. And my father said, if I'm going to be hanging down there, I'm never going to make it. And I said, well, so we were worried. Thank God it did not happen. As I said, God has been with me in many cases. So my father was spared. He, uh, he recovered to some extent, but it was only for a short time. Three months after I got in this camp, that was the Navy camp, the Japanese told us that we were going to be moved to another camp. And we had to be outside, and they lined us up, and we had to walk to the train station, carrying whatever we could carry. That was all we were allowed to bring. My father could hardly walk, so I made arrangements with some friends to stand nearby and to hold them up if necessary. And, but at the same time, we had to carry our bags. It was a long walk, and my father collapsed a few times, and we had to hold him up. Finally, we, we, we had to drop our bags, whatever belongings we had, we drop them on the street in order to keep him up. And when we came to the train station, we found out that Indonesian natives, they saw this happening, and they were very good-hearted. They picked up the bags, they followed us, and when we arrived at the train station, they gave it back to us. The Japanese tried to ch chase them away, but so we got our bags back. We thanked them. And we got loaded on a train, and this was the most horrible ride. I mean, we got into uh, uh, wagons that were boarded up, and as I said, we were in the tropics. It was hot. It was all boarded up. We got no food, and we got no water. And the train ride to West Java, where we were the next camp, took about 24 hours. And people were thirsty, and they, there was no water. People started drinking water out of the toilets. The toilet, whatever water there was, they were drinking it. And, and then you couldn't go to the bathroom, so people were, were urinating and, and uh, having bowel movements all over the place. There was things, people were on the floor. And, and because of the heat, it, some of that stuff uh, evaporated, got up on the ceiling and dripped down. It was horrible. And we were thirsty as hell. And that was really what uh, I still remember the most. And I concluded that dying from thirst is worse than dying from hunger. It was terrible. 
my father barely survived. We survived. We, we finally got some water, and then we were taken to the next camp, where we are again were spending time in barracks. Where there was also torture around us and forced labor and you know, all kinds of things. So there is in the camp. I find uh, I, I find living through the camps. It is in a way it opens you up to life. You learn. I learned a lot. There's one specific incident that has been with me for all my life, even today. When I was in the camp, we had to stay in the barracks. We were laying right next to each other. There was one person there. Most of the people in my camp, they were former officials, executives, bank people, uh, plant, plantation managers, like my father. And there was one Jewish person there. He was a former fishmonger, poor person. And he was, uh, that, uh, there was no discrimination against Jewish people like there was in Europe. But most of these people, they did not interact with Jewish people as much. And he was not somebody that was befriended by other people. But I took an interest in him, he took an interest in me, and I realized that this was a most wonderful person, very generous. I asked him how he got there, and he told me that he was running his fish store, and one day a young boy came in there, and he was chased by the Japanese, and they found him, and he was carrying a gun. And they caught him, and I guess the boy was executed, and they picked him up because they thought he might know more about the guns. He was taken to the Camp Etai, which is similar to the Gestapo in, in Europe. He was tortured, or, and, and he was in terrible shape. When they finally concluded that he didn't know what they wanted to know, they wanted to get rid of him, and they dropped him off in the camp, and there he was. And uh, he learned that I had volunteered to be with my father. I noticed my father was very sick. He was very, very uh, sympathetic, very caring, and I got to know about his problems. And more so than anybody else, I realized what a wonderful person it was. And what really kicked it off, it was one time in the camp, we hardly got any food. It was a bad day, it was raining, Japanese didn't give us any food. We assumed that they must have lost some battle somewhere around. Didn't give us anything to eat all day long. And finally at night they got just a little bit of food. People were so distressed in my, in, in my barracks that some people they got up and they were crying. And they, grown men, they were crying. And one person really lost his senses. And he said, these damn Japanese, this and that. And he said, I no longer believe in God. And I wish I would be dead. And, I, and he, was, he lost control of himself. Then this person, Aaron Vandenberg, who was just as hungry as everybody else, he comes down there and he embraces him. He said, quiet down, quiet down believe in God, you know, you can survive. He said, damn it, I don't believe in God, I don't believe in your Jewish people, and he was obnoxious. And Aaron van der Berg tried to quiet him down, he couldn't. Then he walked away, he walked to his area, and a little bit later he goes back. I still get emotional. He brought whatever little food he had, gave it to him. The man was surprised. Everybody was surprised. He ate it like a hungry dog. And I went back. I ran, I ran after him. I said, I can't believe what you did. He said, this man has a wife and children that may be waiting for him after the war. He said, I lost my wife. I have no children. Nobody is waiting for me. His life is more important than mine. So I told him, I said, I don't want you to die. He said, don't worry about it. Three weeks later, somebody came at the entrance of our barracks, which was not unusual. They come there with a little stretcher. They say, is there any dead people here? Somebody in the back, they say, yeah, it's a dead person here. So they went in there. And I was at the, at the entrance of the door. 
they come out with somebody, and I looked at the hood. My gosh, it was Aaron Vandenberg. I was out besides myself. I cried, and I was, I held on to it. I saw him being carried away, dumped on the truck to be taken out of the camp, presumably to be thrown in a mass grave, and that was it. And that has stuck with me for the rest of my life. I've learned from this man. I've learned. It's an example of the goodness of the people that you find out this was a person who was neglected, a poor person, and I, the other person was a bank executive who couldn't control himself. And it gets, not that that is understandable, but you, you you get to know people much. You get to find out that they are so much different under those circumstances than you think they would be. The Japanese guards were. Uh, very abusive. First of all, when they walk around the camp, you had to stand up, and you had to shout, Chotsuke! That is a Japanese word for stand. And then you have to, when he walks by, you cannot, you can only look at his boots, and you have the bow for him. And when he has gone by, you say, Just me, and, and you stand up. Everybody has to do that. So when he walks around one after another, they're all bowing. And if somebody doesn't do it properly, they come out there and they beat you up. The typical way of forcing people to talk is to hang them and to beat them. Quite often they have burning cigarettes that they put on your body or in your nose or in your ear. One treatment was fairly common. That was, uh, we called it the water treatment. They would lay somebody down on the floor and put a garden hose in his throat and pump water in his throat until this belches up, you know. And then the Japanese soldier will jump on it and, and they jump and all the water comes out to make you talk. And if you don't talk, they do it again. Several people have gone through that kind of treatment. And that was another thing that. Uh, you hate to think about that you have to go through that, but we had some people nearby that went through that, and some of them, they had permanent problems with their stomach. And, uh, <clears throat> and then there was the forced labor, you went out, they, they, they collected anybody that, that was able to do any kind of work, they had to go under guards, with armed guards, they take you out to the road or to the airport, and they have you work, and they get beaten up if you don't work hard enough. I had to do some of that too, and I got beaten up a few times. My father did not because he was too sick. But uh, and uh, well, the camp a tie was like the Gestapo. They had other techniques. They would pull your nails out of your fingers and toes. And, uh, and I hear that somebody was uh, uh, interrogated and they said, if you don't talk, I'm going to chop off your fingers one after another. And to intimidate them, but they didn't talk. They finally, they chopped off one finger. And they said, if you don't talk, the next one, the next one. As far as I know, it stopped at one. I, I'm not aware of, of more than that, but those were some of, I have not seen that myself, but that's from what I have heard. A lack of medical care was also severe because one person, another planter, a good friend of my father, he uh, got an infection. It was very common because we were, there were bugs and there were uh, lice and everything. And uh, you know, when you got you got injured, you easily get infections. He got his thumb seriously infected, and finally it looked terrible. And there was a doctor in the camp, not practicing doctor, but he was. It was uh, like us, he was there. And he went down there and he looked at it. He said, you get gangrene and you're going to die unless you, your thumb has to be amputated. And he said, yeah. He said, but he couldn't go to a hospital. And he told the doctor he was desperate. He wanted to get out. He said, can't you do that for me? And the doctor said, well, I can try but I can't give you any anesthesia or something. And they said, if that's what you want me to do, I'll try and do my best. He said, yes. And they boiled, he had some 
equipment, some knife and, and I think a nail cutter or something. And the man came down there and we heard him scream. He went down there, they, they cut off his thumb and they bandaged it up. And somehow this man survived. He got out of the war and one of the things that happened. And other people that were sick, I had, I had um, and, uh, what was, uh, I had uh, hepatitis, a case of hepatitis. And I saw a doctor and he said, well, you know, just hope for the best. And thank God I got out of it without getting special treatment or without going to a hospital or anything like that. So that medically, uh, there was no medical care. Food was terrible. You were lacking food. A lot of people got very, very lack of vitamin B, and then you have your legs swell up. And uh, one way to notice that is if you push it, it leaves a dent in there. You know, and there were a lot of people that had very, very. And uh, about twenty percent of the people in the camp died from starvation or from lack of medical care. And my dad was sitting there. He was terribly bored. He couldn't do any, anything. There was nothing to read. He couldn't read books. They had no newspapers or whatever. I helped him bandage his things. So if he needed something, uh, there was dysentery. It was very common. So if he had dysentery, I would help him get to a, a laboratory. You can call it a laboratory. Did whatever I can to make my... And I washed his clothes. We had to do that outside. So that kind of thing. Other than that, I couldn't do very much, but uh, I think what gets you through it is you have to have confidence. You have to have a belief that most people had that someday we will beat those Japs. We will win the war. We have to wait it out, but victory will be ours. We will someday will be liberated and that keeps you alive. But there were some like this person that lost face. And they said, why are the Allies still fighting? It's a lost war. You know, why don't we give up? And why did the Japanese kill us all? Because life is not worth living. I mean, some of these people began to think along those lines. But most of the people stayed alive by having confidence. Another thing that's very interesting, that people were so hungry that they got interested in food. People started to exchange recipes and they would tell us, oh my gosh, one time my wife made this and that and that. They talk about food all the time. They were all men. They were not talking about women, which would be common in a situation like, oh no, there was no, and, and in fact, I think everybody was impotent because you had no, no food. They were, they, they were talking about food and we were dreaming about what we were going to do when we came out. And that kept most of us alive. One thing I got in the camp was a sweet potato, which was called ubi. And sometimes we got, instead of rice, we got a little piece of sweet potato without anything else, no vegetable, nothing. They gave you here. And <clears throat> quite often we got the remnants. And sometimes these sweet potatoes, they were bad. They were smelly. They were... But I ate sweet potatoes and there was a time that I thought if I ever get out of this camp I would look at myself sitting next to a basket of sweet potatoes and I would eat as many sweet potatoes as I can eat. Oh, wouldn't that be wonderful? The opposite happened when the war was over and when I went back to Holland one time I was treated by friends and they had some sweet potato and I tasted the sweet potato and I couldn't stomach it. And even today, my wife likes sweet potatoes, but I can't touch it. I don't know what it is, psychological or whatever, but this is one thing that I simply can't eat. I get nauseated if I eat sweet potato. There were boys my own age, and I had one close friend with whom I did a lot of things uh, together, and it was very sad he survived. I saw him get beaten up several times, and he was courageous. Sometimes we, you know, my <clears throat> we went through a hard time. We were supportive to each other. He was supportive of my father also. Hank was his name. 
And when the war was over, and uh, we didn't even know the war was over, but I left the camp and tried to find my, my mother. And uh, he tried to find his mother, and he was caught by extremists. And we presumably was killed because he was never come back. He survived the war, but shortly after the war, he got lost. When the war ended, there was no, no liberation. No British people, uh, armies, no British, US or Dutch forces came to liberate us. It was especially up to the Dutch to do so, but they didn't have anything. So we were left there with the Japanese. In the meantime, the Indonesian population, they saw an opportunity to get their independence. And in fact, the Japanese had told them that uh, if they would support the Japanese cause, that after the war they would become an independent country. So the Indonesians, a lot of Indonesians, de decided to go for independence. And uh, Sukarno, who was the leader of the uh, independence movement, declared independence for Indonesia. He had a lot of followers. And many of these people, they would be called them extremists because they were out to kill. And sometimes some of these people were out to kill, not so much for their independence, but to enrich themselves, to rob banks and everything. So there was total chaos. And these people were around and they were on a killing spree. They didn't invade our camps because we didn't have anything to rob from us. But when we showed up outside and they saw somebody say, hey, you know, we're going to kill them. And uh, that is what, uh, all, what could have happened to me when I left the camp and came back. And what my friend, he was caught and we assumed, we, he, he left the camp and he never saw him again. We assumed he was caught by extremists, either was shot or was uh, uh, kidnapped. We were in the camps and we were totally isolated from the outside world. The Japanese went out of their way to make sure we did not get any news, no newspapers, no radio broadcast. Nobody was allowed in the camp from the press or from anywhere else that could talk to us. So we were left there not knowing what was going on in the world. And um, at some point in time, there was a rumor that the war was over. And there were rumors before, they were false. So when this rumor came, hey, the war is over, uh, nobody believed it. And then the rumor persisted, and then some, we heard that, yeah, the Americans had developed a super bomb, it's called an atomic bomb. They dropped it on a Japanese city that blew up the whole city in one, one bomb, and it was so devastating that Japan gave up and says, surrendered, and the war is over. People they said, you know, you must be you must be getting ready for a mental institution because this is ridiculous. An atom bomb and nobody would believe it. But the rumor persisted. We didn't know the I mean, parties were going on all over the world. In New York they had confetti parades and everybody was we didn't know what was going on. We thought the war was still on. Finally, a young man who believed that the war might be over. He said, I'm gonna test the Japanese. And he told some of his friends, he said, I'm gonna climb out of the camp and kind of see what happens. They were scared to death to see him get executed. He went right in front of the Japanese guard and he said, and he started to climb over the fence. And the Japanese guard came there and he shouted, and as you come down, he made all kinds of noise and he pulled them back, but he didn't even beat them up, which was normal. We expected him to be executed right on the spot and nothing happened and everybody came to the conclusion. He said, something has changed. So the next day, a number of people went to the camp commander and they asked, what is going on? And the camp commander said, well, tomorrow I will make an announcement. He wouldn't say anything else. And the next day he announced the fact that the war was over but that they had been instructed by the Allied forces to continue to be responsible for us, and they were gonna help us, they were gonna give us more food, but we had to stay calm, we had to stay in the camps, and blah, 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 which some people did, but a lot of people said they're with it, and they 
left the camps and they started to look for relatives. We didn't know whether my mother and brother were still alive and we didn't know where they were. And everybody in the camp was like that. And some people got ambitious. I was 17 years old, a typical teenager, despite the fact that my father didn't want me to. I said, I'm going to go out and going to try to find my mother. So I went out and I started hitchhiking and I got caught in the crossfires with some extremists, some Indonesians shooting at us and there were some dead bodies and, geez, and I reached Bandung where I knew there was a women's camp. And I got there and I found out that my aunt was there, which was surprising, but my mother, nobody knew where my mother was. And I went back and I got back alive and I told my father, and he said, you see? He said, no more. And then all we could do is work with the Red Cross. The Red Cross had offered to try to bring families back together. And they collected information from us. Where did you last see your mother? Where were you? And, and, uh, and the same thing with my mother. It took a while. I guess about a couple of weeks until finally there was a notice on the bulletin board that the Red Cross had some information for Wiederholt. So uh, and we went down there. And my father, in a way, said, hooray, there's some information. But then the information could have been good, it could have been bad. It means information. They could have told us, sorry, she has died. So I went with my father and he was nervous as hell. He was shaking and he, he expected the worst. And we were waiting there. Finally, we were let in. There was somebody from the Red Cross sitting behind the desk, looking at it. He was fumbling through some papers, and we, were, oh, we, we could die. And finally, he looked up with a little smile on his face. Good news. Your wife and, and son, younger son are still alive. They are in central Java. He told us what camp they were in. My father said, when he came to, he said, how are they? Are they healthy? Are they in good health? He said, I don't know, but they seem to be in good enough health that we can, they can be transported to you and be reunited with you. And that is what took place. They were trucked in on a tr by train and by truck. They were taken to the camp and we still had to sleep on the floor. And, Camp life continued, but we had better food, and we were able to get some medical care when we were sick. So that was a big improvement. But and then we had to wait for shipping because all these these people wanted to go back to Holland to so recover. For in Holland, that was the mother country, and there was not enough shipping to get there. And my father wanted to go back to the planta plantation, but it became evident that it was far too dangerous to do that. So we gave up. And we didn't go back to the plantation. And several months later, maybe half a year later, a friend of ours went back to Indonesia. And my father asked him to go to our house and find out what happened. And he reported that the house was empty. Everything was gone except some paintings that I had inherited, that we had inherited from my grandmother. And my father said, could you pack them up and ship them? And they went to Holland. They decorated my mother's house until she died. Then I brought them over here. I have some, my brother has some. That was all that was left. My father, as I told you, he was in very bad shape. He survived the war, but he died shortly after the war because it was not just the skin disease. He got a heart disease. He got uh, angina and he was depressed. He lost every. My father was very wealthy before the war. And my grandfather was a doctor, very well-known doctor in Indonesia. My father was the only child he inherited from him. He, there were three houses. Well, he had four houses in Indonesia, and they were all taken away from us. And my father's investments were lost. He was finally repatriated to Holland, had nothing. He, had, he was young, he was only uh, 50, 52 years old, so his company wanted him to go back to the plantation. But the doctor, he was rejected for medical reasons, so he had to retire early. And uh, there was no retirement benefits. We were suddenly poor. 
he was he was used to have everything he wanted. He, we had nice, he had two cars, you know, the, a, 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 a nice Packard, you know. And my father never thought that he would ever have any problems. And here he was in Holland, in bad health, lost everything, was forced to move in with his parents-in-law, with my grandparents, and he was devastated. And I came along and I studied hard and I went to college. He couldn't pay for college. He felt terrible about that. I told him, don't worry about it. I can borrow money, I can work, and I got myself through college. But it bothered my father tremendously and that accelerated his death. He finally died. He had, he died, he was in bad shape. He had angina and he couldn't walk very well. One night he went to bed, he was very tired. And the next morning we found out that he was dead. He died in his sleep, which in a way was a good way for him to go because Life had stopped for him. I mean, uh, Holland had been liberated from what uh, there was. It was quite different from what it was before the war. There was a great lack of gasoline. You saw, saw hardly any cars, and there were only a doctor or a policeman they could drive. Everybody else, you had to go by a streetcar or by bicycle. Food was still rationed. And my grandparents were complaining about it because they had these coupons and they, you could only buy so much bread and only so much uh, ham and, and butter and cheese. And, uh, and they were complaining about that. And I thought to myself, my gosh, how much better are you off? I wish we had had half that much when I was in the camp. But there were those limitations. There was no oil and there was a great shortage of housing because Holland was bombed. Part of several cities, they had big sections that were destroyed. So the government forced you to take in people. So my my grandparents were living in a house. They were forced to get two other families in. So all the guest rooms, so because there was a lack of housing. And that continued on for several years until finally people started to rebuild houses and then this was uh, alleviated. But again, it didn't impress me too much because they still had a hell of a lot more space available than I had in the camps. But my grandparents were very dis very. Uh, disturbed about that. When my father passed away, he had a life insurance and pretty good amount of money. But the insurance company, they almost went broke. So when he died, they were only able to pay about half of what they should have paid. And there was no way to get more. But my mother got that money. It was just enough for her to buy a small house. And then she, would, she was a widow and uh, a survivor of the war and the government allowed her a small pension. So with the small pension and the house, she was able to get by. And I had to scrape up money to go to college and to study. So I saw my mother from time to time. I helped her whenever I could, but she supported herself and I got by myself. I am fairly ambitious. I was in Holland and I studied and uh, became an engineer. And I felt I wanted to see more of the world. So I decided upon graduation, I wanted to work for a, a company that would send me out abroad. And I was thinking of the oil company, the Dutch Shell company, and they have facilities in Venezuela and the Middle East and. I thought that that would be exciting. Or I, I wanted to get away. When I was a student, I had an opportunity to participate in a student exchange program with the United States. So I had a chance to come here. I could barely afford it, but I got here. And I was stayed with some American families, including one family in the Boston area that, by the name Sherwood. And I found out they were a little bit like Aaron Vandenberg. They were people that they did so much good. They were helping refugees from all over the world. And they took an interest in me. I told them something about my story. 
and they were excited. And they said, and I told them that I wanted to go abroad after graduation. They said, you want to come here? You want to live in the States? I said, yeah. I said, uh, you know, if, they said, well, they said, we'll be glad to help you. So I had a choice, either join a company like Philips or Shell or something, or come to the United States. And I finally decided I wanted to go to the United States. She sponsored me. She had to sign. She had to guarantee that uh, if, if I were running out of money that they would support me. They gladly did that. So I moved to the United States. and I, I had only $200 with me when I came here in 1953 and I had no job. So I was, I spent first few, I spent a few a weekend with them, and then I went to the YMCA in Boston, and I bought the newspapers and I was looking at ads. I didn't know how you go about getting a job in this country, so I was longhand writing some letters, and I got no answers whatsoever until finally an employment agency contacted me, and they said they thought they could find me a job if I would pay them for it, and I said no. I said I'll, I'll pay you after I get a job. And they found me a job, and the company was nice enough to pay the fee. And I got there. It was interesting. I was staying in the YMCA. When I got the job, it was in Ipswich, Massachusetts. It was about 20 miles north of Boston. I was going to report to work. So what I did is I checked out from the YMCA, and I brought my suitcase. That's all I had. I went on the train, went to Ipswich, got off the train, the company was within walking distance, so I walk in there with my suitcase and I come to the employment office and said, here I am. And they gave me some papers to fill out. And finally, they said, what is your address? And I left it open because I still had to find a place to stay. And they said, you have to put your address down. He said, where, where are you going to stay? He said, I don't know. He said, after work, I'll try to find a place to live. And he smiled and he said, well, he said, we've got to take care of that first. So he called somebody from the, uh, the personnel office to go with me by car to look at some, they looked at the newspaper to find an, a room somewhere within walking distance. And I went down there and that got me started. And then I went on, I had several jobs and I ended up starting my own company. While we were in the camp, that large uh, camp in Chimahi, we, uh, there were 10,000 people there. There was a kitchen in the camp which People in the camp, they had to cook rice, and, and there was a bakery. They, they would bake bread. All we got was a piece of dry bread for lunch. That was all you got. No coffee, no nothing on the bread. That was all we got. But then the Japanese cut us off from yeast. We got everything, but there was no yeast. So they said, we cannot give you bread anymore. We can try to, to give you some, some gruel or, 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 or like opium. I don't know what they were planning to do. Some chemists in the camp, and they said, you know, there must be a way of making something that will take the place of yeast. And they developed a method which involved the use of urine. And they tried it out, it worked. And then there was an announcement, they said, well, we, we can make bread, but everybody has to collect this urine. And we have big drums everywhere, and everybody pees in the drums. And during the day, twice a day, the people come there and they lift these trunks, take them to the kitchen, they, they boil them, they cook them, I, and they use the stuff to make bread. And we had bread again, and we ate that kind of bread for the next two years. I learned a lot from my relationship with Aaron Vandenberg. I learned how important it is to, uh, to do something good and that you don't want to be selfish in any way. I didn't grow up in a religious family. My parents were not church-going people or whatever, but you hear something about it. And I have come to believe in a God. I came to believe strongly that the importance of life is what you learn from life. And I came to the conclusion that what I went through in the camp was a great blessing to me. Because, for example, my grandchildren don't have that kind of background. They haven't seen poverty, they haven't seen hunger, they haven't seen torture. I have gone through all that and I've seen how people behave under those circumstances. Some people 
do well, some people don't. I've seen corruption, I've seen people stealing food from other people. And I have encountered a person that set an example for me. What it is, an example that is very hard to follow. And I realize when I think about it, this person gave away his food. And sometimes I think, you know, you have these multimillionaires and they give millions to a hospital. Or whatever. That's great. But then I think it is wonderful what they did, but it's nothing compared to what Aaron did. He gave a little bit of food away. Basically, that was all he had. He had nothing else. And it meant the end of his life, probably, because he was desperate for food. So he was the real generous, the real philanthropist, this person. And the important, you, you put things in perspective. And so that has been a big learning experience for me during the war, which has affected the rest of my life. And, and I, I feel blessed that I've had that experience. And finally, I am, this is my second marriage, married with Aaron. And for a long time, I didn't talk too much about it, even my own children. I talk a little bit about it, but the interest span is short. After a while, I say, oh, Dad, he said, yeah, nice talk with you. I got to go to soccer. I got to play. They picked up some bits and pieces. But the story, like I'm telling you, and like I've written up in my book, Never Kate Got Out. And my wife, Erin, insisted that I write it down. She said, she said, you know, you're getting older. When you pass away, that story is gone forever. And you, so you want to, and that was a very good suggestion. It took me a long time. I'm not really a writer, but I managed to write the book, The Soul Conquers. And I named the book after a war monument, which is in The Hague, the Netherlands for uh, the uh, war victims from Indonesia. And that uh, has the name The Zeal Over Wind. And when you translate that, that is The Soul Conquers. And that, the font picture of my book, on the cover of my book, is a picture of that monument. And my mother suffered so much in the women's camps and after the war, she was instrumental in getting that memorial built because there was a more inclination in Holland to remember the survivors of the German occupation and often forgetting about the people that suffered in the Netherlands Indies. And my mother was instrumental in getting it built. And finally, after about 10, 15 years, they built that monument. And when my mother died, she wanted to be cremated and her ashes to be put around there. That is how strong she felt about that. I'm six foot three. By the time I got to my grandparents, I weighed not much over 70, 75 pounds. I was skin over bone. I was very thin. We all looked like that. My mother, when she came out of the camp, she could hardly recognize her. And uh, my father was, oh, he was a terrible shape. And uh, my younger brother, he came through the war seemingly well, but when he was checked, medical, he had a medical check in Holland, they found out that he had spots in his lung, lungs, and he was uh, uh, taken to a, a sanatorium in Switzerland, in Montreux, Switzerland, for recovery. And he went there, my mother joined him. It was paid for by the government. and. Uh, after that, he was recovered and uh, he did well. So we are very blessed that there were no uh, lasting medical effects. My father had lasting medical effects, but my mother was okay. My brother, after this treatment, was okay, and I am okay. There have been quite a few people that have suffered stomach problems, uh, heart problems, kidney problems, long for long time for the rest of their lives because of what they went through during the war. And uh, we have been questioned about that and some of these people have been receiving help from the government for medical treatments. But again, God was with me and uh, I came out well. I'm, I'm almost 80 years old 
still in good health. My mother lived to be 91 years old. She had a hard time, life was very difficult for her, but she made it. My brother is still alive. Thank you very much. I am very happy to have the opportunity not only to talk to Aaron and my children, but I wanted to talk to a little broader audience, especially with regard to historical aspects. Most people don't know me, I'm not a celebrity, but what I went through should be of interest to a lot of historians and people interested in World War II history. So I'm very appreciative of the fact that you came down, Alta came down here to talk to me, and, uh, and I hope that the information I gave you can be put to good use. Mm -hmm.